Hi class, welcome to Human Anatomy and Physiology. In this class we're going to be talking about the structure and function of the human body and this is the very first recording of the very first lecture so let's dive into it. As we look at anatomy, human anatomy is primarily the study of structure, the physical shape of that molecule, that organ, that bone. I want to emphasize anatomy is the study of structure, physiology is the study of function. And as we look at structure and function, we find that structure determines function, or I could turn it around and say that function dictates structure. So as I look at a hammer, a hammer has a big flat head on it, a long hamel, handle, and a lot of mass on one end. This means that hammer, the structure of a hammer, makes it very good for pounding a nail into a piece of wood. The structure of a hammer, though, means that it functions very poorly for putting a screw, and here's my picture of a screw, for putting a screw into some wood because all it can do is apply linear force. However, if we look at a screwdriver, and here's a Phillips screwdriver, Phillips screwdrivers uh, have an ideal structure for applying rotational force or torque to a screw to put screws into wood. Screwdrivers make lousy hammers, and I'm willing to bet most of you at some point in your life have grabbed a screwdriver by the shaft and then banged on a nail with a hammer handle of a screwdriver, and it just doesn't work well. Structure determines function. And in our human body, if you look at the structure of a body part, you could have a pretty good guess about what that body part does based on just the shape, the structure, the anatomy of that body part. Now, as we look at the human body and we're examining the human body, we have different ways to gain inf information. First, um, we can inspect the human body. And this, is, and this is just looking at the human body. And when we say this, these terms, these are all with a medical or clinical intention. So that's the underlying context here. So um, if you're looking at somebody and you're thinking about how they're really attractive looking, that's called oogling them. If you're looking at somebody and you're trying to gain medical information about them by looking at them, that's called inspection. Here's another one. If you feel a human being um, to gain medical information, that is called palpation. Um, and there's different words for feeling human beings that have different connotations, such as um, fondle or touch um, or grope. All of those different words mean to feel a human being, but they have different connotations associated with them. When we say palpate, the connotation is you're feeling a human being and trying to gain that medical information. To listen to somebody, um, typically with a stethoscope, to gain that information, we call that osculation. And then if you tap the person or the patient to gain medical information, that's called percussion. Now, to gain information about human bodies, we can do more than use our to look, listen, feel, and tap. <laughs> we can also cut apart the human body. And that's where cadaver dissection comes in. And cadaver dissection is an awesome way to learn more about the human body. I've had the pleasure of teaching human anatomy with male and female cadavers. And knock on wood, I'll be teaching human anatomy with cadavers again in the near future, assuming we get our new science building at UW-Eau Claire. Um, I'm optimistic it'll happen. And when we look at cadaver dissections, this is when we take a human corpse that has been typically preserved <laughs> mercifully. Back in the day, they didn't preserve them. You had to dissect cadavers while they were fresh because they had about a three-day lifespan. So now we have cadavers preserved in alcohol and formalin, and we cut them apart and look at the gross structure of the body. We also could do comparative anatomy, and this is your traditional zoology course um, where students will dissect a shark, um, a rat, a sea urchin, a starfish, you just cut apart many, many different animals and compare how body parts are similar and different across different species. We also can gain information about the human body with exploratory surgery. And as that 
name implies, you cut a person open and you just look around to see what you can find. Traditionally, exploratory surgery has been fairly invasive. It involved a scalpel making a rather large incision, um, usually at least an inch long within the human body. Now, exploratory surgery is much more rare because we have medical imaging. And if there is exploratory surgery done, it's with a very small incision and then an endoscope and probe is inserted into the human body. So there's a lot there's a lot less superficial or secondary, I should say, tissue damage to the patient. When we look at medical imaging, we look at the inside of the body without opening up that human body. And as we look at medical imaging, radiology is a branch of medical imaging, or branch of medicine, I should say, that's concerned with that medical imaging. And as we're looking here, we can see a radiograph of a human being. This radiograph is from a coronal or frontal view of a female body, an adult female. And you can see bones and organs. Um, notably here, check out that urinary bladder that's lit up bright pink. That's really standing out to me within this figure. And the bones themselves also stand out. They're very prominent. Other forms of medical imaging, um, or forms of medical imaging, I should say, include x-rays. And when we think of an x-ray, this is the oldest and most well-established form of medical imaging. Dense tissues appear white, less dense tissues are black, and this is by far the most common. It's the cheapest, it's the most effective, and um, it's done everywhere. We also can take some radio-opaque substances and insert them in the human body. And these radio-opaque substances are going to be injected into the human body, and then they are going to block the transmission of the electromagnetic waves that were passing through the human spot the human body we typically will inject or swallow these individual or these substances into the human body and then they heal fill hollow structures so, um, for instance here is a view of a radio opaque substance that's been injected into a carotid blood vessel, the carotid artery. And then you can see how it travels upwards to the brain and it twists back and forth and then it distributes its um, radiopaque substance very diffusely throughout the brain. On, in addition to blood vessels, we oftentimes will use radiopaque substances to view the hollow spaces, the lumen of the intestinal tract. Oh, wrong button. There we go. We also can use a CT scan or commuted tomography scan. This used to be called a CAT scan. And when we make a CAT scan, we have many, many low intensity x-rays. And we make, using those low intensity x-rays can form individual slices, sliced views of the human body. Um, the big catch with the CT scan is that that takes some processing power. Thankfully, computer processing speeds have been increasing. Um, they haven't been increasing quite as fast as they used to over the last five years, but we've been compensating for that with multi-core processors now. But as we look at this, we're able to take all those x-rays and form an idea of what is on the inside of the body in more detail than when we use a traditional single x-ray. We can also use an MRI. An MRI is also the same technology behind nuclear magnetic resonance. So for those of you who have taken organic chemistry and you study NMR and how to interpret NMR spectra, it's the exact same principle behind uh, MRIs, or magnetic resonance imaging, where we use highly powerful magnets to take electrons and point the spin state of the electrons all the same direction. Then we release the magnet, the electrons bounce around and release radio waves that are picked up and interpreted to make a image. As we look at MNR, um, MRIs, MRIs, because they require ridiculously powerful magnets that need to be super cooled, they are typically more expensive. They also take longer to perform, but they give you very high quality images. A big downside of MRIs is that the individual being scanned needs to hold still. MRIs are the best way to view structures that are made of soft tissue. Um, when you're looking at CT scans, they can do, they're kind of the in-between, they work for soft tissues a little bit and for hard tissues like bones. And then we have x-rays, which are specializing in hard tissues such as bone. We also can use positron emission tomography, aka a PET 
scan. And this is a way that we assess metabolic activity. We take a radioactive glucose or sugar molecule, and usually we'll have one of the carbons replaced with a radioactive isotope. And then we have the patient um, ingest either through drinking or through injection radioactive sugar water. And then that radioactive sugar water goes throughout their body and the tissues in their body that have a high metabolic rate will consume more of those glucose molecules and then glow bright red on the screen, and then tissues of the body that have a slower metabolic rate will glow a different color or not be lit up. So in this instance, they're blue. This radioactively, or these PET scans, I should say, are a great way to identify cancerous tumors because the cancerous tumor has a very high metabolic rate because the cells are actively dividing and growing rapidly within them. So for identifying tumors, this is the preferred method. We also can have sonography, a.k.a. ultrasounds. Ultrasounds are fairly common. They're the second oldest and second most widely used form of medical imaging. Nearly everyone now has seen an ultrasound of a baby in utero. So the pregnant woman will go in, she'll have her uterus scanned by the ultrasound, and the ultrasound device will send in high-frequency sound waves. Those high-frequency sound waves are then bounce back to the receiver and will give you an idea of what is happening inside of the soft tissues. Ultrasounds have been improving quite a bit over the years. Um, back in the 1990s, ultrasounds typically were grainy two-dimensional images, and now we can have really cool three-dimensional images in real time. I remember uh, for my youngest child going in for an ultrasound with my wife and seeing Annabelle move around in utero, wiggling her arms and hands. with the, They called it the four-dimensional ultrasound. They had height, length, width, and time. So it was in real-time ultrasound movement for the fourth dimension. Um, it's also worth mentioning that ultrasounds can be used for therapeutic purposes, but the therapeutic ultrasounds are going to use different frequencies of sound waves compared to medical imaging ultrasounds. That's all we have for this recording. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the lecture, discussion boards, or to shoot me an email. And as always, happy studies.